Thanks for having us come by today. I'm glad you came by. I like showing the studio off and talking about what I've done over the years. So it's really cool for me and people that are curious to what I do. I didn't realize how long you had been doing all this. And then you posted something on Facebook a couple of years ago about concert photography. The concert photography is what got me into, into what I do. You know, at the ripe age of I don't know, 16, my father gave me a camera for Christmas. And, you know, it was just one of these little, little X-15 um, Kodak flash bulb cameras. You know, it's a, it takes a cartridge film back. It's pretty funny, actually, looking at this thing. But anyways, I, I, my first concert was uh, Santana. And I took the camera, right? I'm taking all these pictures. I'm like eight, eight or nine rows back. So I was all excited because I took all these pictures. And I said, man, I can't wait to see them come back, right? And so when the pictures came back, if, if you're a photographer and you really know about it, you know what happens when you use one of these flash bulbs in a dark area? I had like three rows of really white, bright heads and the stage was just like orange and I could hardly make out what it was. And it, I got pissed off and said, this, this sucks, you know. So, uh, you know, I was bitching to my mother about it saying, man, I really want to take better pictures at these concerts. And she, and she was working with a woman for the state. The two of them worked together. And this woman had actually shot, you know, uh, a photo pass for uh, the Rolling Stones. I can't remember. I think it was at Madison Square Garden. So she took me out and she bought me my first real 35 millimeter. This is kind of like it. Um, but, uh, you know, film camera, back opens. You know, people don't know it's where the film goes. Anyways, um, we went out, we got this and started taking pictures with this and I was flabbergasted on, you know, how it all worked. It was just amazing how I, I, you know, if you understand the process of, which I still really don't, but I know how it works. When you have film, the silver highlights, you know, when you, when you, when the shutter opens, all the, all the, little particles go to their destination on the film that see the light. So all I can, all I can imagine in my brain is all these, all these little things running from corner to corner to get in their perspective spot, saying, I'm light, I'm dark, I'm going here, I'm here, I'm medium, and then you get an image. And it's like, damn, how the hell does that work? But anyways, um, I, I just thought the process was cool how you snapped the shutter and you stood, you, you, you froze time forever. And to this day, I still love doing that. Um, but I got into processing my own film. So if you've ever processed film, black and white, it, 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 they, they really mean follow the temperatures. Because I, you know, the, 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 the final fixed bath was done, everything looked great, and I had to wash it. So I put it in a wash bath and the water was too warm, right? So I washed it for whatever, 20 minutes or whatever. Take the film out, the images on the film are unbelievable, right? So uh, I take my squeegee and I squeegee the film. And what <laughs> happened? All the emotion came off with the squeegee. So now I'm stuck looking at a blank roll like there was nothing ever on it. So my first lesson on proper temperatures when you're when you're mixing. But, you know, moved on from there and uh, just started going to concerts. And that was really, if I, if I was able to have my choice in life to do what I really wanted to do, it would have been um, being a concert photographer, shooting the brochures and traveling with the bands. And because that's what got me into this. And that's what I, and I still, I still love to do it. But at 61, it's just to, to try to fight the crowds and the people. And I, I was over that probably many years ago. But I see kids doing it now, kids, you know, guys, whatever. And they don't realize, now I sound like the old time photographer, but, you know, we had to switch film, 36 exposures. You know, we had to make sure that we we're on, 
you know, am I shooting 400? Am I shooting 200? What roll of film should I put in? Should I shoot Kodachrome 64? Should I shoot Kodachrome 200? Because 200 can push to 400. Now it's just, it's dark. Let's raise the ISO. <laughs> you can go to 16. I mean, there was no color 1600 ISO or, you know, whatever. I mean, you can go as high as you want with these cameras now, and it's just unbelievable. So they have a real good advantage to shooting like a show like that because you really get, you know, you get three songs. So you got to, you know, I'm pounding out four or five rolls of film and three songs. Now you can, you know, and I'm getting what, a couple hundred images. And now you can get a couple thousand images in three songs. And um, you go home and you edit. You don't spend another $200 on processing, which, you know, I'm not getting paid for these things. I'm just doing it myself. Even when I, even when I, later on, when I was able to get photo passes, it, it was, it was, wasn't for big money. There was never any big money, even shooting local bands. There, it, till this day, I still shoot bands and it, there's still no money in it. It's very, the bands don't, bands just don't have the money. But a really good story with this, with this 35 millimeter, when I first started, I think I was maybe 17. And it's when KISS had the double, remember the KISS double live, like in the 76, 77, when KISS was so big, it was, you, you know, it was impossible to get to see him. We got tickets and me and a friend of mine went, we, we snuck my camera in. I had a 200 millimeter, we snuck the camera in. Um, how they didn't find it, I have no idea, but we got, we snuck, snuck our way up to the front, right on the railing. So I'm stuck on a railing <clears throat> and my main, my main um, objective at this show was to get Gene Simmons, you know, blowing the flame, which is like iconic, right? At least back in the day. So I'm up there, I'm shooting, I got thousands of kids, cause I'm on the railing and I got these, the whole, the whole audience is, you know, just pouncing on top of us and I'm taking pictures, taking pictures. So it was a camera just like this, but a long lens. And, you know, I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. All of a sudden it stops. And I said, shit, I got to reload the film, right? So, you know, 35 millimeter, you got to push. Now you got to mind, you got to remember, I'm, I'm stuck on a rail. I'm 17. I'm new at this. It's a newer camera. So now I have to change the roll of film. So I have to push the button in. And that's gotta, not the auto wind or the batteries. No, or no you motor do it drive. By hand, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm like this, you know, winding it, trying to go fast because now I see Gene Simmons walk off the stage, which I know <laughs> he's going to get the torch, right? So I'm I'm going like a madman to try to try to wind the film. So I got to open it up. I got to take the film out. Now again, with thousands of people pushing against me. I got to take the roll of film. I got to stick it in my pocket without dropping it. I got to dig into my pocket down here, get another roll that's already open because I knew this would happen. Put the roll in, get it over to the point to where I make sure it's loaded correctly to where I don't shoot 36 blanks. So I have to get it in there. I close the back up. I, I advance it to the first frame. I crank this a little bit to make sure it's tight. I lift the camera up, I focus. He walks out with the flame, just as I focused. He blew the flame, I talked, uh, shot the shot. Nice. And I, I have that picture. Show you that picture right now. And this is the picture that I got of Kiss blowing the flame. 1977. On 35 millimeter. 35 millimeter film. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was sweating like a, I was sweating like a dog on that. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of motion in there. There's a little, you know, but again, uh, it doesn't matter. It's a 200 millimeter lens. Uh, yeah, I sweat my ass off. I, you know, I was rushing to get it. I saw him walking out. I, I'm, I'm lucky I got it that sharp. But, you know, if I had a, um, if I had a Canon R6 at the time. It would have locked right I in. I would have had nothing to worry about. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But, um so yeah, we got that shot, and then you know, uh, what I what I did, you know, um, backing up a little bit before that, um, when I started going to see the bands, 
uh, I saw ZZ Top at the Palace, and I had the most awesome pictures. I mean, they were actually, um, they were actually coming right in front of me and actually playing the guitar and pointing the guitar at me. I love that. Yeah. 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 You know what I love the, the most, though, is when I sent the film out to be processed, I never got it back. It was E6 film. Either somebody at the lab, you know, fell in love with them and kept them or got lost in the mail. So that um, got me into processing my own E6 film, which is slide film with people out there that have been doing this a while know what that is. So I just, so that's when I started processing my own E6 film. I started processing my own color film. Um, I started making my own color 8x10 prints. And what I would do when I was in uh, senior in high school, I'd go see a band and I'd go, uh, I'd go on a Friday night and the band back in the day would play two nights in the same bar. So I'd go shoot all these pictures on a Friday night and then the next day, that the next day I would spend the day in my in my house, uh, my apartment, in my closet, um, processing negatives and making eight by tens. Then then I'd go to the bar the next day and I'd have all the eight by ten prints laid out on the on the on the table. And as the band members walk in, they see the pictures and they start saying, "Wow, where'd you get these pictures?" I said, "Oh, I I processed my own film. I was here last night. You know, you guys want to." You know, you guys are for sale if you want to buy any. So they start buying them, and and lo and behold, that's when I started making a making a dollar with the camera, and and you know, from that point on, things just started snowballing. Um, you know, my parents uh, uh, they pushed. My father really wanted me to go into the service. I really didn't want to, but um, I it, to make him happy and to keep the peace in the family, I I, I joined the navy. And I did my time in the Navy. Um, I did uh, three years, three years uh, in a fighter squadron working on F-14s, which I wouldn't trade that for the world. It was a really good experience. And uh, even in the Navy, I took all my all my darkroom equipment and made a makeshift uh, uh, darkroom in my bedroom. And we down there, we'd go see shows, and I'd do the same thing, come back and spend the next day if I had it off processing processing film in my in my house and my navy buddies couldn't believe that, you know, it's cuz back then, you know, there was no one hour photos. It was just, you know, you had to wait a week. And the the week the week wait was 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 heart-wrenching cuz you didn't know what you had, you know. So, half the time I get it back and there's like one out of 24 I, that I like. You know, the, the the whole thing about the digital age is uh you know, it's a, it's you learn as you shoot. It's like on the job training. You take a picture, you look at it, it's bad. You can fix it right there in the spot. You know, back in the 80s, before all this was around, you took the picture and you sent it out and you had to wait a week to make your corrections, you know. And um, I mean, or, or if you were shooting, a, there was a process called E6, that, like I just discussed uh, earlier. I didn't always process that kind of film because that was very intricate. But, you know, same thing. There were labs around that could process that E6 in four hours. And that was, that was awesome because, you know, if you're working on a commercial shoot and you're shooting, you have a big setup and you want to see the results right away so you could take the setup down and move on to the next, you would go get the film processed and in four hours you'd have it, you'd have it back and, you know, um, be able to move on to the next project. Um, you know, so... Just through the years, I mean, I did my Navy time. I did, um, it, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was a great experience. Um, I worked on a flight deck uh, of an aircraft carrier with F-14s. Um, I had the chance to meet the, the president and uh, President Carter and his wife. Got two pictures in the studio here signed and uh, framed and an actual uh, letter from the White House about me asking them to sign a copy for me. I gave them a copy and, you know, in the letter, it's not from them personally, but it's from their personal secretary that saying that they were happy to sign them. They love the pictures and, you know, um, you know, so that, that's a nice, that's a nice thing to have. So, um, you know, I get out of the service. I, my parents opened up a deli. I worked in a deli for seven years. Through those seven years, I'm playing with photography. My father hated the fact that I was you know, devoting time to do that. Ironically, he bought me my first camera, which is 
quite funny. Um, unfortunately, you know, he passed at age 62 um, before I really started making a name for myself. So he didn't get the chance to see that, you know, because you always tell my friend, you know, we got a beautiful sub shop here. We make a lot of money. He wants to do this photography. He ain't gonna make it. He ain't gonna make any money with that photography. He should devote all his time here. And I'm saying this isn't what I want to do. You know, the, a really, really funny story is he's trying to get me a. Um, you know, the I worked with him. I'm going back and forth here, but I worked with him for all these years. Then I, I leave because I want to pursue my. I want to pursue my photography. So I get a job at a camera store to be involved in, in working with cameras and selling cameras. And, you know, so I, I did that for a while. And then one day the, the, uh, the owners came in, they sent the, they sent these suited guys in, they shut the door and I said, what's going on? I was the manager at the time. And he says, ah, we're closing your store down. You're done. They came in, they started loading boxes up with all the merchandise and, from that day on, I was out of a job. Just and like that? Yes, just no warning, no nothing. Because if they warned you, then you're going to probably take what you want and get the hell out of there. And, you know, so it was, it was like just they're in, pack up, and they're out. They lock the gate, nobody's back in. So, uh, so now I'm out of a job, <clears throat> and uh, I'm putting my resume all over the place. You know, my father knew a, you know, my father had drove a CDTA bus for a while. And uh, so he knew some people higher up in the in the bus terminal. So uh, now my whole life I did everything my father wanted me to, to keep the peace. It's just the way he was. And I didn't just, just wanted to keep the peace. So uh, the, the day that, um, you know, so he's trying to get me into driving the bus. So it's good benefits, it's good pay, you know, I still want to be a photographer, right? So I have my resume into all, this, all these photo studios and my father has, he's talking to the CDTA. So um, I get a letter from a, from a photo studio, Metroland Photo, great, great guy, my buddy Mike, still, still good friends with him. He calls you up and says, hey, I got your resume, I'd like to give you an interview. And so I went in and interviewed and you know, a couple days later, he offered me the job. That same day, my father called me and says, hey, I got you a job at CDTA. I say, he goes, you got a, it's a great job. You're going to do benefits. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you know it's, it, it's perfect. So now I'm thinking, okay, my whole life I've done what you wanted. I went into service. I played a trumpet. I did this. I did that. I said, all I could think of in my brain was Ralph Cramden. I said, I'm not going to be 50, 60 years old sitting behind the wheel of a bus wishing that I was a photographer. So I said, thanks, but no thanks. So I took the job with Metroland Photo. We became friends. That's my commercial you know, photography. I started learning that, started learning how to shoot weddings. I worked with him for a couple of years. He had to lay me off because things got really tight and really slow. Worked for another photographer. Um, Bill DeMichael, who was a big tattoo um, photographer, has a book book out called uh, Women in Tattoos. Really good book. It's all just all women in tattoos. Worked with him for a year. And then um, I'd always have to bring this film to this photo lab called Bokeland Custom Visuals. It was the biggest lab in the area back in the 80s. And, you know, I heard that they were looking for a sales rep. So I said, that would be a really good place to meet tons of photographers and really be in the mix. So I applied there. They gave me the job, worked there for nine years. And through those nine years, just made connections, talked to people. And in, those, in, that, term, in, that, in that time, I'm building my own commercial business, working out of my basement. Um, I had no studio, but I, was, I, made, I made anything work. And um, so working at the photo lab, you know, now my, I'm, I'm, I'm able to push my, my, my personal self. And I stood the weddings. I had started shooting weddings probably five or six years before the photo lab. But now at the photo lab, now I'm meeting, meeting more people. So my wedding business is starting to take off. 
So <clears throat> I'm going to tie this little story into my working in my basement to show you that you don't need a big studio like this to make something work. So my wife was a avid fan of a of a um, a soap opera called As the World Turns. She got me kind of addicted to it. I remember that one. You remember that one? Yeah. yeah. And so we're watching it and we watch this one new this new person come on and it's wow, she's she's really nice, cute, you know. We're watching. And then one day my wife's reading the soap opera weekly magazine and sees that the this newbie that we were just talking about that we thought was cute and looked good and had a great part and she's getting married and she's from Voorheesville. So what I did was, okay, let's see. She's in Voorheesville. We know her name. So what I did was I just, I went through the phone book and I called every name in the phone book that had that name. And I asked the person that answered, is this the, is this the residence that has the daughter on As the World Turns? And, you know, most of them are saying no. And then this one lady says, yes. You know, like kind of skeptical. Am I a weirdo? Am I a stalker? Probably not the first caller. <laughs> yeah, I know, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I go, well, listen, I'm not a stalker or anything. We, My wife and I are big fans of the show. I see that your daughter's getting married. If I send you some information, can you, can you forward to her? And maybe I can get an interview and maybe shoot her wedding. So she goes, sure, send the information. So, so, uh, that was around October, didn't hear anything. And then I knew she was going to be home for a break, you know, around the Christmas break. And I said, if I don't hear from her now, I'm not going to hear from her. So lo and behold, she, she called me up and we interviewed. She, and I'm not still, I don't have a studio. We met at my kitchen table, just showed her some albums. She loved my personality. She liked Everything that I showed her, everything that we talked about, two days later, she called me up and said she wants me to shoot the, shoot the wedding. And I'm only doing weddings for like five years. I'm so new at it. And she was getting letters from everybody all over the country who, who knew her. Because she, she had one best soap actress of the year. So she, her name was big. And um, so she goes, I, we want to do an engagement picture in the studio. I said, well... I don't really have a studio. I said, if you don't mind going down to my dirt floor basement with my crumbling concrete walls, I have a little makeshift studio down in the basement. I said, would you be willing to do it there? She goes, if you can make it work, then I'm good with that. So I got this other picture here I'll show you. And this is just to show you that you don't need a big, huge studio space like this. So this was, this was done in my basement. Nice. You know, the ceiling is literally another foot above her head. <laughs> I had them sitting on milk crates. And I said, just love each other. Do what you do. Just And, you know, this is one out of many that I took. But just to show that she, had, that she had no issue being in the basement. She said, as long as it works, uh, you know, let's just do it. And, you know, I shot the wedding. The wedding turned out great. Um even though I had cameras breaking, you know, breaking down on a wedding. And thank God I had a, my assistant that was with me was, he was a camera repair guy that worked on the cameras that were breaking and he got it working. And, uh, you know, she didn't know that story until later on, you know, I was telling her, but, but yeah. And then, you know, that wedding, you know, my deal with her was I give you, I give you the best price I can possibly give you, but I want to be able to advertise that I did your wedding. So I did a, a wedding show in one of the malls and had a bunch of her pictures hanging up along with a bunch of others. And, you know, I could hear people yelling halfway down the hallway. I think, look, who, look who's on the pictures down there. And they came running up. And, nice. you know, I started shooting weddings. You know, that's how my wedding career really started taking off. And um, that was the break. That, that, was a, that, was a, that was a big break. Yeah. And, um, you know, so... I, I just stayed at the lab for nine years and um, just kept building my business. And, you know, uh, I got a phone call. Uh, well, first at the lab, the lab called me in when I had my, when I had Junior. 
the day he was born or the week he was born, they called me into the into the office at the photo lab after nine and a half years and says, you know, things are really slow. We got to let you go. I said, wow, well, that's great. Just had a baby and, you know, my career is taken off, but it's not taken off. You know, I'm not making the money to, I was in there, I was working there part time building my business, you know, I, and in the, in the course of that time, I had put a, like a, a little studio behind my, like a garage that I turned into a studio behind my house. So I was able to expand. But I told, uh, you know, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not, we're not going to go get a, uh, uh, a daycare and then the money I would make at another job, pay daycare. So I'm going to make this, it's, it's now or never to make this photography work. So we agreed. So um, she was working for the state at the time. So um, me and my assistant are, you know, I'm doing small commercial jobs just to keep the money flow going. Um, but when caller IDs were big, my phone rang in the studio behind my house. And on the phone, the caller ID, it said Orange County Choppers. And I said, my eyes lit up and I says, this could be big. So I answered the phone, and lo and behold, because uh, at, at that time, I had started shooting for uh, some of the magazines, uh, some of the motorcycle magazines. Okay, so you were already shooting bikes. Yeah, I already, okay. yeah, it, it's, I'm fast forwarding, and there's so much I've done, I just, I, I, I forget, you know. That How long had you been shooting bikes when Orange County Choppers called you? At that time, um, it happened when I was working at the lab because one of the girls I worked with, her 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 boyfriend, uh, worked at a company, local company called Biker's Choice, and they their main shooting studio was in Texas. So they, but they needed they had a supplement, and their their main one of their main warehouses offsite warehouses was was here in uh, Gilderland. So the 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 kid that worked there. Asked his girlfriend, hey, you know that guy you work with that, that takes the pictures? Do you think he could do some motorcycle parts? And she asked me, I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So that, you know, that was my introduction. And luckily I had the studio behind my house because now I can work in, you know, in, in like a studio. I had a white floor, a, a, a little psych wall and the whole nine yards. So I did, uh, so I started shooting her parts and then they said, hey, we got this, we got this bike we want to, get shot that you know back then they had these things called rolling chassis where you would buy a frame the wheels the everything that would make the bike run except the motor so we got we got this rolling chassis we want it shot we want to put it in the magazine you know as you know as a sale to show that we sell these things i said yeah we can do that so we did it and then they also brought me a custom bike that was already finished from the rolling chassis, with, you know, you get the rolling chassis, you can you can make it look like this with paint and all of that. So I take the um, I take the picture of the bike and I said, "Wow, this is really cool." I wasn't even riding motorcycles then, and I said, "This is really neat." So and then then I saw you know saw the ad in the magazine. It was cool because now I'm starting to see my work published. Um, so uh, so after that. The Orange County Chopper guys called up that magazine to find out um, who took the picture because they wanted to do the same thing. So they said, well, this guy up in Albany took the pictures for the, the ad, so that's how they got my name. They called me up and said, hey, we got these rolling chassis that we want to put on the back cover of the magazines. Would you, you know, you want to come down and talk about it and we can maybe do some business and... Lo and behold, I went down and, you know, they showed me what they wanted to do. And I went down with all my lights and and did a make a makeshift studio set up down there and shot the rolling chassis. They loved it. And, you know, that's where my pretty much my motorcycle career and, you know, magazine career started was right there. And, um, you know, Discovery Channel saw it asked Orange County, we want to start putting your motorcycles on our websites. Who's doing your photography? And this Discovery Channel calls me and says, every bike they do, we want you to go down there and we want you to shoot over the cameras, the camera guy's shoulders and record what's, 
what's happening. So for every bike they did for three years, um, I was right. I was right on their shoulders shooting every every bike. I have such a collection of Orange County bikes. You know, back in the day when they were big, they were it was it was big, and the the, the one bike they did was a POW uh, MIA bike. They brought it to my studio. The magazine wanted it for their cover, and so the Discovery Channel came up with the with the bike and filmed the whole thing of me shooting the bike for an episode. And so not only did I get the cover of that, but I also got 15 minutes on national TV of me shooting a motorcycle. And from that point on, I've been, you know, known all over the country for shooting motorcycles, which is awesome. I never thought in a million years I'd be shooting motorcycles. You know, I thought I'd, I thought I would have one one day and, and ride them, but not to the extent that I did, you know, now I'm like, my name became very well known in the motorcycle industry. I was in, you know, I've had four covers in one month. I've, I have over a hundred covers. A um, hundred yeah. motorcycle 100 magazine, magazine covers. And I'm just not unknown. These are all national. I mean, like to the fashion world, it would be like a Vogue. Nice. You know, like Easy Rider, the American Iron, Hot Bike, you know, I mean, over a hundred easily. And I can't even tell you how many features, not on the covers, you know, probably three or 400. So it's, it was a good run. Magazines are all, with the digital age, mag magazines have all since folded or moved on. You know, the magazine Easy Riders that was, that was started in the early 70s, um, they, they folded like last, a year and a half ago, two years ago. American Iron was the last standing one. They they held out for quite a while, and they just folded uh, probably less than a year ago. So, I mean, on average, I was shooting 40, you know, maybe 50, 60 bikes a year for magazines, and now I might be doing 10 or 15 for cus just customers I want their bike shot. I still love doing it, and I, you know, it's, I have the space to do it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it was a it was a fun run. It was a lot of fun. That sparked the uh, interest in having that bike week that you do here, the big event. Yeah, once a yeah, yeah once a week. Well, that's yeah. I mean, uh, it, even as it was dying out, um, you know, I I did these runs maybe ten ten years ago called the uh, We Care Ride. Me and four, three other people were involved in it. And, you know, usually when you have a run, it takes time to get it together. You know, it takes years to, to, get, a, to get a following. But the first year we did it, we had probably 800 people in the, in the bike run, which was phenomenal. And we did that for 10 years. We raised thousands and thousands of dollars for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And we would donate the money to the to the cause. The first year we don donated all the money to the cause. The second year I didn't like not knowing where the money went. So the second year we donated half to the cause and we picked a family for the other half. So the second year we were able to give an actual family that was in need of the money seven thousand dollars. So that was that was a good feeling. Nice. Um, so so then you know through the years you know I you know riding bikes and doing this I always saw these I always go to these bike nights and. The bike nights was like maybe 50, 60 people. You know, you go, you hang out a little bit, maybe a little music would be playing or whatever. I said, and they'd have them every other, every, every third Wednesday or every Wednesday or whatever. I said, I think I want to do one bike night a year. And I, what, you know, it's, 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 there's no rain date. It, it's got to work and period. So the first one I did, I, you couldn't move out here. There was, probably 400, 400 to 500 people. The whole studio was filled. I had an indoor custom bike show and it was just, it was phenomenal. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's really funny because there's so many people that come, I don't even know. They just, they, they either follow me or here or whatever. I mean, like on Facebook, I got tons of, tons of friends on Facebook. I, just, I don't know who, a lot of them are, but I like to make, I'd like to invite everybody in so they can see what I'm doing, which is why I do these bike events 
outside so people can come and check the space out because not only do I work here, I like to rent this space out too. You know, it helps, helps with my, my monthly fees of paying for this place. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and then, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm still doing bikes. When I built this place, I, I, I did a wedding for uh, the owner's daughter of Hemmings Magazine. They have four or five different, they got like a classic magazine, a, a hot rod magazine, a, you know, a couple other ones. And I told the, the, I told the father who owned the magazine, I said, listen, I just built a new studio. Not sure how I can do a car, if it will work, but why don't you bring one down and let me try. And he goes, all right, I'll bring you a car. Car came in, shot it, looked beautiful. Guy loved it. And then that started me shooting the cars that I do. I got a company from Boston that when they, when they it's called Factory 5 Racing, when they build a car, they bring the car to me to have me shoot it because they, they're kit cars. So they want to show, they, you know, they might bring the frame down. I'll shoot the frame. And then they, then they build the car and then they bring the car to me. And then I shoot the car and then they put it in their brochures. Same with there's two other big car companies in this area. Uh, Varilla Motorsports is huge. Does all these custom uh, Corvettes, you know, rebuilds and, and uh, services the Corvettes. And another guy, Chris Mackey, who does a lot of uh, Mustang cars and, you know, they're, you know, they, every time they bring their stuff to me to, to have me shoot, to have me shoot it, which is great. I love, that's the stuff I love doing. You know, I mean, the weddings, I'm, I'm doing 30 to 40 weddings a year. A lot of people think that I'm, I'm the motorcycle car guy that I'm not doing weddings anymore, but I'm still, you know, I've been doing weddings for 35 years and I think I do a, I think I do a great job and I'm still, I'm still at it. And my son now is my second shooter, which is which is really cool. And you know, maybe in a few years he might be taking the wedding business over, and I'll still stick to the commercial work. So it's been a long run. I mean, I'm, the it's, uh, the cameras are ever changing. I got into drone flying. You know, I, I'm using a Mavic Pro two now, and this this has this was a game changer for me in the past year. Um, I I I can't do. I can't get enough of it. I'd love taking this thing out and I use it. I use it commercially. I got my license and you know, you need overhead real estate stuff done. I, we did a huge, uh, a huge generator, generator turbine removal up at some big power plant. We flew the drone in there and they, they couldn't believe the, the imagery that I got because they said, we, we've never had angles like this before. This is awesome. You know, you, you had to document the removal of a generator turbine at a power plant. Yeah, they wanted pictures of the whole process of yeah. what happened. So they they use it for their their um, educational, you know, to show people this is what happens when we take a when we take a generator out or a or a gas turbine or whatever. That's a big deal. It's huge. Yeah, huge, huge. You know, and that, the cool thing about the drone is. I can get the drone to where we can't get because of safety reasons. But the drone, it's not bothering anybody as long as I keep my distance and so on. But, you know, um, I can't go out to that spot, but this can. Plus overhead shots are phenomenal, but they're inside working where you can see from the top down, but you can't see from the sides. So I fly it up and I got to be very careful and I got to be intricate on where I'm going because there's a lot of sensors on these and you got to know how to maneuver around and up and over ducks and all that stuff. So, you know, I worked out that, that shoe worked out really good. So this is, this was a, this was a, uh, like a boost in my, in, in re reinventing and re, you know, uh, re-energizing my, my system with this thing. So it's kind of fun. I'm doing my best to stay out of it, but those are real tempting. A lot of my friends are flying those around. Is that the one you used to do that shoot for that car dealership? Yeah. Earlier this year? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. came out great. Came, it, yeah. The quality of the thing mm -hmm. is just, uh, it's amazing. I mean, I, I'm i floored on it. I mean, yeah, you, can, I mean, uh, you can't make a 40 by 50, but you can make some good quality prints with this. I've had them made on, especially on metal prints, and uh, stuff looks awesome. Looks awesome. How many megapixels you got in there? 
I believe that camera is a 20 megapixel. That'll do it. But the sensor's not huge, so, you know, you have a little bit of, you know, uh, limitations there. But, uh, you know, you, you, unless you're going to look at it with a microscope or blow it up to, you know, building size, billboard size, you're gonna, you'll are gonna you see it. But for everyday usage, yeah, I've, I've had, like I said, I had a couple of 20 by 30s on metal prints made, and they just phenomenal, phenomenal how nice it looks. But uh, just we're moving right along, just uh, staying busy and, you know, 16 years in this space. You know, those are, those are my stepping stones. I was in my basement for, for 10 years. I was behind my house for 10 years. And then I've been here now for 16 years. But the thrill of seeing your first real studio, like the one behind my house, was just, you know, I mean, right, right then is when I knew that this was my life. This is, there's nothing else that I want to do. You know, I, a, a lot of people, you know, they say, oh, your work, you, I've never seen anybody shoot as good as you or whatever. My, my, my thing is um, to stay humble because there's always somebody out there that can kick your ass that will blow you away. I mean, you go on YouTube sometimes, and I look at some of the stuff that, these guys half my age are doing is like, how in God's name do you do that? You know, I'm like the guy from Albany that does really good commercial work, really good straightforward work. I'm not a special effects guy. I'm not, I mean, even like the drone stuff, you see some of these guys out there, you know, doing these drones, like for movies that are running these, these, these drones that it, it's amazing. Oh, I just, it's crazy what they're doing. And then they're color grading. The footage so well afterwards. Yeah, yeah. That's just crazy what they're able to do with it's, those. It is. It really blows my mind. I mean, totally it's a whole blows new, my mind. It's a whole new art form. It really is. You know, it's unbelievable what they're doing. You know, what a lot of folks probably don't realize, if they haven't been to your studio before, is that you can pull a car right in here and you've got this, assuming we have the wide shot going on that camera, maybe you can see this gigantic softbox which is probably the biggest softbox in upstate New York, right behind I us here. Love that thing. Probably. Right? Hey, you mind, I'll tell you a story about that box. So I'm thinking, okay, how hard can it be? It's just, it's, it's a frame with fabric, and you, the main part was the, the light that comes through it underneath. So I went to the hardware store, and I bought all this PVC, and I bought these metal rods to go in the PVC so it had a little stability to it, which I really didn't need because I had it hanging by four, um, eight chains, four in the front, four in the back. And that was stationary. That's where it stayed. So I built the box. The hardest part was figuring out what to put on the bottom for the soft, for the light coming through it. So I got, uh, I got muslin material, bleach white, I said, this is probably going to be perfect. So I, I put it up, took a shot of a reflective object, and it didn't work because all I'm seeing are big spotlights coming through the fabric. So, okay, so we got to figure this out. So I know in these soft boxes, they, they have a baffle. There's always a baffle. So there's, a, there's an extra layer of material between the actual main material and the light. The inner layer of diffusion. Right. So what I had to do is I went to Joanne Fabrics and I'm it was it was kind of funny because I'm going I went to the to the the material where they would use to make wedding dresses and the only way I can make out if it would work or not is I would take the material and if I could see my shadow of my hand then I said well, okay that, that the light's going to go through that but the 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 biggest thing was I had a I put it up to a spotlight and if I couldn't see the round spotlight but I could still see through it, then I knew that that was probably going to work. So I bought a big piece of that, but that only came in five width. Five, uh, width. The, the width was only five feet. I get it in any length. But all I, all I needed was five foot because it was just a baffle. Right. So the box had four lights in it. So I, so I put an inner layer baffle with the wedding dress material. Then I put the muslin over it. And I put that same reflective material out there. And I started cracking up. I said, this is... This is it. <laughs> this is this is it. Then I got my buddy to bring his bike down. We put the bike under there, and I was just, 
You know what it is about that light is it's the continuous, the continuous line that you get in the reflective object. There's no break. There's no hot soft box. There's no three soft boxes hanging over the top. It's one continuous, nice, beautiful line. But, you know, uh, the specular highlight is just phenomenal. And that, that, that's what I love. But the problem is I couldn't, I couldn't adjust it. So if I wanted the background darker or lighter, I, 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 had, a, I had a finagle. So said, All right, so what do I got to do? So I call up a good buddy of mine, actually my, my printer, because he's very mechanically inclined and, and has ideas. I said, I, I need to fix this box so I can make a, so I can adjust it. So we came down, we, both, we were both discussing. So we figured we took the chains off. And so we bought two winches. And we have the winches mounted into the, into the ceiling with a remote. And so when, one winch uh, adjusts the front and one winch adjusts the back so I can, and then it goes up and down. The hardest part about that was your pivot point because there's only one pivot point now. I mean, you got your main pivot point in the middle and then two cables that go to kind of support the edges a little bit, but that's just little support. The main support is in the middle. So what happened was when we did that, because I used PVC, even though I had metal rods in there, the PVC started, it started looking deformed and it was flexing and it just looked unsafe over a $100,000 car. So I did a lot of work at the, uh, a lot of functions at the Modern Welding School. So those guys decided, I asked my buddy who's a, who's a, uh, who's a professor up there, a teacher and said, what do you what do you think about maybe you your your school building me a box, you know as a as a as a, an assignment? Because yeah, I, I think we can do that. I think what all you really need to do is buy the material. I said okay, so we used a one by one material, and it's almost like a rigging, like a stage rigging. Mm -hmm. Looks like stage rigging underneath all that fabric, and they use that. But he said to me, he goes, all the stuff that you've done for us, we're just we're donating this thing to you fully. I said, oh, nice. that's unbelievable. Came in here solid as a rock. And the hardest thing was, like I said, getting that middle pivot point. So when you lift it up, it stays, you know, because now I have, actually I use bottles of oil up there to keep it, you know, it's like a, like a scale. I got to move the oil bottle a little this way or a little that way to keep it, to keep it level, you know? So, um, but yeah, that box cost me, well, this, when I built it, when I first built it with the PVC, it cost me 300 bucks. And then when I redid it with the modern welding, so it didn't cost me nothing. It cost me a couple dollars for the material um, when I redid it. And the other thing that I had to do was uh, the, the, the upper layer was uh, that silver insulation board. But the silver was too, uh, the specular was too, too much. So I went in and spray painted it flat flat white, which, which really, that was, that was the ticket. You did the whole inside white? Yeah, yeah, flat white. A lot of people rent the studio space just for that. There's nothing else that I can think of uh, around here where you've got a softbox that big and it makes things so much easier. It's really, the only problem with that softbox is it's um, very flat. So if you want to do something, you know, with like a, like a dramatic look or something, you can't use that box because it just throws light everywhere. So a lot of times when I'm doing some of my sports pictures with really like grungy type shots with hard light, that light's not on. I'll just use like side lights and back lights. That light is just too, um, too soft, too, too big, too, too much light. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, aside from the gigantic softbox that works so good for the bikes and the cars and all that, what advice would you give to up-and-comers? <laughs> like, okay, you got, you got a 19-year-old in front of you, somebody junior's age, right? And they got some pretty good work. They want to be a professional photographer. What kind of advice would you give them, like, realistically? Like Run really fast in the opposite direction. Don't look back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's harder than ever nowadays. 
anybody can be a photographer, but not everybody can make money doing photography. Uh, it's a, especially nowadays, since everybody's a photographer, everybody thinks you can pick up a cell phone and be a photographer because you got a good, you got the latest, you got the, you got the iPhone 12. It's a phone. It's not a camera. When people say, my camera is unbelievable and they're showing me their phone. That is a phone. It's not a camera. You, you, got, you got to be diligent. You got to keep doing it. You got to keep, uh, this is where the new generation's coming in and kind of like taking over. They can blow me away on the, on the post and the hashtags. You know, I got, I got 10,000 followers. Okay, but how much money did you make this week? That's the bottom line. I mean, people say, oh, you make, you make great money shooting weddings. But to my peers, I'm, I'm probably less expensive than a lot of them. I think I'm as good, if not better than a lot of them. But the pro the, what they have is they have the social media. I mean, they could be in their late 30s, early 40s, and their, their followers are 10 times more than what I got. Um, you know, because they know how to do the, do the hashtags and the, and the, the social media. But commercially, it's all totally different. You know, I, half, half the guys I know that are doing great doing with the weddings can't pull a car in their studio, or can't pull a bike in their studio, or can't put, you know, 50 people in their studio and do a 50-person shoot. I can do that. Or maybe some of them don't even have a studio. Exactly. I mean, I, there's a lot of my friends that I know that they meet people in like Starbucks, Starbucks and, and I'm not downing that. That's not, you know, you do what you got to do. Uh, but if you're just starting out in this business, you got to, you got to, you, you got to have something interesting, something different, something, you know, I mean, my wife says it to me a lot of times, you know, why don't you do this? Cause that's probably never been done. And I'll look it up online i'll just type in whatever dog jumping through a hula hoop on fire and i guarantee you you're going to get a thousand pictures of a dog jumping through a hula hoop on fire no matter what you type in it's been done you got to figure you got to you got to find your way to make it different and to make it yours you know because again uh people will say well that's already been done i said well, i know it's been done but i want to do it i want to do it my way so you, you, me, some of our other photo friends that we've gone out shooting, we can go out and shoot the same thing, but everybody has a different look, a different way of shooting it, whether it be the angle, the lens, the, the exposure, whatever. You just have to make it your own. I kind of miss going out and, and shooting, shooting waterfalls. I got a couple of friends that constantly go out and shoot. In fact, me, you and I did a couple of shoots together. And it's, once you get me out there, I, it's, it's like heaven. It's, you know, I, I totally enjoy it. I love it. it I, you know, I miss, I miss that part of it. But if you want to be a photographer and it's, you want this to be your living, then you have to work it. You have to, you have to give, you got to give your time. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. You know, back to the question of my advice to a, photographer i mean to a to a to a youngster is you know find people that you can associate yourself with where you can i mean there's there's been a few people that i've helped out that have come in and and worked with me and have met have met some really good people through here and have gotten their business going you need to be you need to affiliate yourself with studios not just one but just work around, see how other people do it, see, you know, meet people, connections. It's it's all about that. You could be the greatest photographer in the world. And if you don't, you know, one, you gotta have the backup. You gotta you gotta you gotta be able to back up your words. And two, it helps to have to know people, you know, to to help you the stepping stones. It's not easy. It's, it's definitely not easy. It's not easy now. I've been doing it for over 30 years and it's still not easy. You know, I got to, you know, people come in my studio and say, oh, it must be great to have this place. It is great. I love it. But it's not great when the phone's not ringing and, and I'm not out working or, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm wondering how I'm going to pay the rent next month or whatever. But the studio is great. Yeah. I mean, there's so many times I've, I've looked around and was thinking about giving it up and, but I, it's just such an awesome space. I can't, I can't, 
I can't leave it. I can't live it. I can't give it up. That's why I want my son to, you know, my goal is to have him become the main shooter and have him have a second shooter. And I can kind of lay back or I'll just go fly the drone and uh, do my commercial work here. So the bottom line is surround yourself from, you know, surround yourself around good people. Never be, don't over, um, don't be cocky about what you do. I know so many people that they're good, but they're very cocky about it. And like I said earlier, you know, there's somebody around the corner that's going to, that's going to blow you away, you know, with the work that they do. So, Always stay, you know, just stay true to yourself and, and be humble. Don't ever walk around like you're, you're it because you're really not. There's, there are so many photographers out there. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I mean, look at these sports photographers, uh, these Olympic photographers. I was watching a special on, you know, how these guys set up for, for the Olympics. It's, it's just mind-blowing what you got to know. You can't just know. You, you, it's not just photography anymore. It's it's. You know, years ago, you'd buy a camera, but that camera would last you 20 years. You know, it was simple to use. It was your f-stop, your shutter speed, and your your ASA back then. You know, now it's your ISO. But you know, I mean, back back in the day, it was simple. You know, line up the line up the needle with the with the the in the viewfinder to the to where your f-stop is. Once the needle's lined up, you take the shot, and you got a good exposure. And you know. Now it's just, there's just so much involved now. As far as keeping busy, somebody was saying, if you want to stay busy for the next five years as a professional photographer, the best thing that you can do for yourself is to get good in Photoshop with composites. Uh, do something that someone cannot do with their phone. Do something that somebody can't copy without serious uh, skill level. I get the um, trying to do stuff that other people can't do on a phone. Um, you said a word that I'm getting better with, but I'm still not good with, which is called composites. Because if you're going to be a composite Photoshop person, there's a difference between photography and digital art. And compositing is digital art. I don't, you know, people may, may disagree with me. I have many arguments with people, but I mean, I'm doing more composites now. I actually just posted a shot the other day of a little boy in front of a, you know, in a Superman outfit. And I put him in front of a city, city, city scene because it was cool. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm getting better with it. But I don't, I'm not going to say that's a photograph because it's not. It's a digital image. Once you lay layers on top of layers, it now becomes a digital image. It's not, I don't believe it's an actual photograph because it's really not. You didn't, it's, I don't know. I mean, people are going to hear me say this and, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. It's photography, it's photography, but it's, you know, it's not. You've taken, I mean, even some people will take, um, other scenes, which I did, you know, through Shutterstock and use that as my background. How can you say that that's my photo image when it's only part? You get what I'm saying? What I'm hearing you say is different people have different opinions about where the line is between photography and digital art. Exactly. And composites might be some gray area stuck in the middle somewhere. I mean, people say, well, you know, you, you take a picture of a car, you put it on a, you know, you, you digitize it and you make it, you make a reflection in Photoshop. That's a composite. No, it's not a composite. That's my actual photograph that I just flipped and I, I uh, turned the opacity down on the flipped part so it looks like a reflection. It's one image. It's just, it's actually, well, it's one image with one extra layer for a reflection, but it's still a photograph. It's still my image. You know, when you look, when you look at a, when, it, when you look at an image that wins a, a huge contest with huge dollars and, you know, they're calling, you know, they're, it's a calling for entries for the next year. And I look at the winner from the last year and it, and it's like, 
and I'll never forget this, three cheetahs sitting on sitting in these mountaintops with these awesome clouds with the sun rays coming through the clouds. I mean, it was like breathtaking. And then I'm reading about the image and it's like 12 different images. And I don't think that should have won a photo contest. That should have won a digital imaging contest or a composite contest, but not a photo contest because it's not a photo. Especially if all the photos aren't your own. Oh, that's that's even worse. I, well, I'll do that sometimes to get somewhere. Yeah, with exactly. Something. Yeah, sure. But I yeah. will never say that this is my image. Just look at this image I took. You know, um, and I don't lie about it. I may not be upfront about it and say, "Hey, you know." I put three images together for this one shot. You know, I may just post it and let people ooh and ah and say, how'd you do that? So, you know, I, I found a Shutterstock image and my image and put them together, you know. I would never lie about an image that wasn't truly done in the camera. Photography, what is photography? Photography is when you pick up your camera and you take a picture and you stop that picture for life. I mean, that's, to me, that's what photography is all about, capturing, telling a story through the lens of what you interpret that to be. I can interpret it, okay, I'm gonna change my interpretation of this picture and put you know, this, this image in with this image, with that image, with this image, and now I got this super image, but it's not an image, it's seven images put together. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's it, like I told it, I think it was B&H Photo had this photo contest. So the girl, it was at the, the one of the expos and I'm walking by and she hints, she stuffs this thing right in my face and send pictures in for our photo contest. And I asked her, I said, are you allowing composited pictures to be in the photo contest? Yeah, because they're photos. I said, no, they're not. So now I'm having this argument with this girl handing out cards that's like 20 years old that works, that's working for B&H Photo, what photography is. Because young kids don't know what, you know, if they're just doing computer stuff, that's, okay, here's a really good example. This one's great. And if anybody has never seen this YouTube video, look it up. All you got to do is type in uh, model, girl model cheese pizza or girl model pepperoni pizza. And, and you're gonna see this, this guy, he's a Photoshop guru, just like amazing Photoshop guy. And he shows this beautiful picture of this model in a red bikini, right? Gorgeous, right? So then he goes, okay, so I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna play my, I'm gonna play what I did in reverse in Photoshop to what I started with. So you see him going through it, and he's doing all this stuff, and lo and behold, it's a slice of pepperoni pizza. So he could actually call that image of the girl with the bathing suit on a photograph if he really wanted to, but it's not a photograph. It's, it's a digital image. I think once you take, now I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about dodge and burn. I'm not talking about retouching. I'm not talking about taking a beer can off a table at a wedding or whatever. I'm talking about taking other images, whether they're your own or they're not your own, and, and sandwiching them together and calling that a photograph. What if I did frequency separation on the model's skin to smooth it out? It's, it's, you're still working on your own image, your one image. Yeah, I'm retouching it, re similar re to how I would have done it. Yeah, in the I mean, because I, I do that. I think, I mean, yeah. hell, when we did darkroom work, we, you know, I had all these tools for dodging and burning and, and, and all that stuff and gradation filters and, you know, uh, all, that, all that stuff. And that's the same thing as doing that in Photoshop, smoothing skin out and stuff. There is ways to do that in a darkroom. Photoshop, um, now I, again, it, I have no objections to compositing. I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool that you, that you can do that. I wish I, could, I wish I was better at it. I don't have any issue with it at all. I just have an issue when somebody says, this is my photograph. Because it's not, it's, it's your digital image. It's your, it's your composite. That's what it is. It's not 
an actual photograph because did it come out of the camera looking like that? No. Well, then it's not. You did, you did work to it, digital work, where you put layers on top of layers. Now, all of a sudden, now it's a, it's a digital image. I, got a, I, got, I know a photographer out west. You would think his stuff is composited. His stuff is amazing, and he's out in the he's out in the uh, the Arizona deserts, and his stuff is unbelievable, and that's true photography to me, true photography. Now, now here's a here's a photo. This is this is what I this is exactly what I love. This guy does these food commercials, where let's say it's a Big Mac, and it's all separated in midair in a white background. And how he does that is he has these robotic machines and these robotic arms with these little thin like spatulas on them. And one spatula has the lettuce, one, one has a tomato, one has the roll, one has the burger, one has the cheese. Mm -hmm. And when he, when he hits the button, those arms quickly go out. So everything's suspended for that split second. And he has the, the, the high type of high powered lights to where it's just frozen on a white background. That's a photograph. That's not taking the lettuce and putting it in. That's not taking the tomato and putting it in. That's not taking the burger and putting it in. That's one shot done the way he does it. Exactly. And I love that. That's the, if I could do that kind of photography, I would, I mean, that's what I would do. I, I would rather not take and put each piece in. Like I shoot a car and I pride myself when I go to the computer and I do a little tweak here, a little tweak there, a little, little rub here, a little, little soft in here, take this line out, you know, brighten this wheel, brighten that wheel, darken the, darken the window. Um, then I take the car and I flip it and I make my little reflection and I'm done. So really, what was that? Two layers, right? When I look at some of these guys, when they shoot a studio shoot, they're lighting the tire back tire, they're lighting the front tire, they're lighting the hood, then they're lighting the, the door, then they're lighting the, the quarter rear panel, then they're lighting the front corner panel. Now they have 10, 15 different images. They take each one of those images and they, they separate everything and now they piece it together. They just do a bunch of layer masks. Yeah. Yeah. So I pride myself in doing all of what you're doing in one shot. Yeah. That's where a 20 foot light bank comes in handy. Real handy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for what they do, now I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong because they're doing it in a garage where they have no light. And for them to be able to make that look like they make it look, it's, it's phenomenal. That's why I'm fortunate to have what I have because I can roll. Like, you, you know, I, I do a lot of photography for, for these car companies that want to put their cars on websites for sale. And so that's what they do. They'll bring a... You know, because if you're going to sell a two hundred thousand dollar car, you, you don't want just phone snapshots. You want it to look real. So they roll it in, and you know, I do my thing. You know, I can't take, I can't take every shot like these guys are doing and piece them together. You know, and why would I do that if I have the facility and the light to be able to do, to do everything in one shot? You know, if I just hit, was, if I, even if I was in just a garage and I was doing this and I wanted every shot to look like that, that I, I'd be, I'd be two days on one car. I get a car in and out of here in an hour and a half and it looks phenomenal. Nice. It looks like it was done in a, you know, like it was done in a major studio in New York City. I mean, it's, it's, that's what I pride myself on. I pride myself on good quality work. That's other advice too. I mean, good quality work. You know, not not showboating, not showing up with, uh, you know, five truckloads of equipment. I go in light. You know, that saying, less is more. That's what I like. The less I use, I get more, I get more out of the little equipment that I bring than bringing 20 lights to a shoot, if you know what I mean. So. Oh, absolutely. So... You've mentored quite a few photographers over the years. 
you know, dozens. Right? Well, here's my thing on that. And a lot of people say, you know, you should be charging. You should charge. You should, you know, you should charge these people more. You should, you know, it's, it's, it's not all about making money. When I was 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, uh, I would have swept your floor for $5 in a studio. Just to be, this one guy said, okay, I'll tell you what, because this guy used to come into our deli that we had, photography. He had a little studio across the street. I said, Rick, don't you, can't you give me any, this is when I was really starving for something, right? I said, can't you give me anything? Just to, he goes, all right, I'll tell you what. I have to do all these slide duplicates. Come over to the studio and you can mount the slides. When I went over there to that studio and was mounting the slides, I, I thought I was in heaven. I wasn't doing anything but mounting slides, but I was in a studio where I could see lights. I could see cameras. I could see, you know, it was, it, it was, it was everything that I wanted and I was, and I loved it. So my thing is I didn't have that at my fingertips. I had to scrape and beg for it. So I have one of the better studios in the area and I'm willing to let anybody come in that wants to learn if they hey can I come and watch you do a car shoot I'm almost embarrassed when people come and watch me do a car shoot because it's so damn easy it's ridiculous I mean there's nothing to it I have a 20-foot light bank I got foam panels on each side of the light bank and that's it simple it's there's no but when you have the when you have the right tools like if you tell me to go put a go put a wall together, that thing will look like crap because I don't have the right tools to do it. You know what I mean? I don't have the squares and the levels and, and all of that. But in photography, I got the right tools. You know, when you see people work on motors, I mean, they're doing it flawlessly because they have the right tools to do it. You know, but if that same person, you give them a camera, you say, go take that picture of that car over there just to give me a nice snapshot they'll be fumbling around with the dials and the and the stuff on the camera I wouldn't even know what they're doing so because i have the right tools you know it works for me here so when when somebody calls you up and says hey can i watch you do a shoot or can i help you out I said, yeah come in come in check it out hang out but you're gonna work if i gotta move a car you're gonna grab a jack and help every help everybody else here do what they do and you know I'd rather come have you come here and kind of put your hands in and get wet a little bit than just sitting in the corner and not asking questions. Exactly. I can remember getting serious about professional photography and taking all these workshops and meeting people that were so generous with their knowledge. And... So that's what just blew me away when, when I started really taking classes and getting serious about photography. Two, two things blew me away. What's possible with strobes and light painting. You know, light painting just blew the lid off the whole thing for me. It's funny because I was doing light painting in 85. I had a garage, my apartment where I lived, where we had our deli. I had a, a parking spot in the lower level of the garage, I'd go in there on weekends with a flashlight and I'd have a bunch of gels with me and I would outline my body with the flashlight, and put different colored gels on it. I'd outline my car, I'd outline the wheels and then I'd throw light, you know, hit different walls and different places with the light and the stuff was unbelievable. It looked really cool. You know, I mean, back then it was, you know, it's cheesy to look at now, but that's where it all started back exactly. then. Exactly. Yeah, the, the bar's gone up a bit. But seeing, we had the last light painting workshop, we had 12 people show up, and most of them were intermediate level. You know, we asked no beginners, if you don't know how to use manual, please don't come to this workshop. Yeah, right, right. One of those. That reminded me, like that wonder that you feel when you learn something new and you're just blown away by how cool what's possible yeah. with all this. It's just, it's, it, you just have to remember that when the shutter opens, it records whatever you have in front of it. Whether it's a blue light, a green light, a yellow light, a white light. Uh, I mean, you gotta be careful of your exposures and stuff like that too. It's a lot of trial and error, but it's so cool what you can do 
with light painting. I mean, you put an object out there and then you, you run around with, you know, like uh, fiber optic uh, lighting with all different colors. Squirrel, I know that's what you guys are doing, so like doing orbs and stuff that you guys are doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it looks cool when you have this one little, you know, the spinning of the light and it's just sitting there by itself. It's like, because anything dark, it doesn't see. So it only sees the light. So it's so cool where you can just go anywhere you want and add light to any any spot. I'd like to do more of that, more of that at night. The oh, light totally. Paint. I got really into that in 2012 and never stopped doing it. Every year we're doing light painting. Yeah. And it just never gets old. Especially yeah, let me know when you guys go out and do yeah. that again. I'd love to, you know. For sure. I think I we did that stuff. one in that warehouse, right, with the, we had the... Oh, yeah, you came in uh, for a while. Torches and... Got the best shot of the night and then left. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that one with Katie spinning it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a risk to the camera, uh, I got but it that was worth it. Do I have that up? I, oh, no, it's up there. Yeah, I remember you used that one at your show that we, yeah. That we went to. Yeah, that Yeah, because I was just putting the... Um, I put the camera on the ground in front of her with a 15, and then I had to walk away because the sparks were just ridiculous. But that shot is because she's pretty sharp, even though she's moving. She's she's relatively sharp. And then you got that one hole right in the middle that where the, the, the sparks, the light isn't. Yeah. And got it's, the and vortex there. With the graffiti on the wall. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. that shot. That shot is so cool. Never get sick of that. No. The last one, we were fire and strobes backlighting for real aggressive silhouettes, you know, while they're spinning the steel wall. And yeah. Now that's the interesting thing. Uh, anyone who's been into astrophotography or gone to the star parties is you'll spend this huge chunk of time with people in the pitch dark, and you never really see them. <laughs> right, so then you'll meet them again in the daylight, yeah, and it's like meeting them all over again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's like I, there's all these people that I met, but I... Yeah. The, a lot of a lot of my shooting too, you know. Speaking of that stuff, I set my tripod up, I set my camera up, I set my exposure, my focus, and I shoot it. And I generally get what I want. Some people are in there; they're a little tilt here, a little this. You got to have this exposure. You got to do that. You got to change this. You got to be here. Oh no, this angle is up, up a little, no down. And it's like you're overthinking, dude. Just do it. I get very, I get frustrated when I see people overthinking what they want to do and and now all of a sudden the shot's gone you, you're spending so much time trying to get it to where you want it <laughs> the shot's over you lost it you missed it it's a real problem for a lot of folks yeah uh you know what i found is once you're comfortable with your camera you know which is a good case some people will say for not switching all the time switching cameras all the time. So you're just real comfortable with your camera. You know all the settings. You don't even have to look at it. Right. You're comfortable with it. It's one less thing to worry about. And then you can just get in the zone so much faster. Yeah. Uh, most of my favorite shots that I've ever gotten is when I'm pretty relaxed and I'm not really thinking about it. I'm not under a duress to yeah. get a specific yeah. shot. You know what I mean? No, exactly. I mean, right now I, I just bought the new R6 and... Um, I'm fumbling because I'm not used to it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to find my focus, my my focus block. To so where the hell's the focus block? Then, because now the whole screen is a focus, so the the focus block can be up in the left corner. I don't see it over there. Then I got to find it, it, you know. But it's get the more I use it, the easier it gets. But that damn thing is like focus friendly, man. Un unbelievable. It thing focuses like I've never seen a camera focus. Never in all the years of doing this. You can't, I don't care what anybody says when people say, oh, I can manually focus better than these autofocus. You cannot anymore do that. Not in a million years. No way. No. Nope. No way. It's, it's to the point where I leave a lot of my manual focus lenses at home. I don't even want to mess with it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're missing shots. You know how many times? I, I mean, I even used to. I had a uh, uh, an eighty five one one two. I sold it because if I shoot up fifty shots with it, two two look great. The shots that look great look great. I mean, they're unbelievable. But you know, I'm not there to miss shots. You're talking about the Canon L series, yeah, eighty five. I had that lens yeah. too. That wire driven autofocus, way yeah. too slow. 
Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah of I know they upgrade, they upgrade. Yeah. But the the other part is it's the depth of field. You know, if I'm shooting, for, especially at a wedding, because I'm trying to get the really nice backgrounds, really nice soft, nice bouquet backgrounds. But all of a sudden, the the focus point hit the nose, so now the eyes out of focus, and it sucked. I would get so mad, but that's it doesn't matter how well you calibrate it; it still does it. Yeah, no, yeah, I but calibrate now with that this, lens like five times. With this R, with this R, it's a R six. That thing will grab your eye and stay right on it. And you know, I'm not gonna get the 85 one two again. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna buy the the uh, 28 to 70 f two because that's your that's your that's your um, your 35 f two. That's your your 51 one you know one four or one. What's the difference between one two and and two? I mean, they're so close, you know. Exactly. That, that's your that's your eighty five. That's your, you know, it's got all those lenses right in right in one lens. So I mean, that's that's the that's going to be the that'll be my my main lens on my one camera. So f twos really about as wide of an aperture I'm comfortable using for anything I'm being paid to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I that used one that'll give me. Uh, That'll give me 1.4. That one's, you've got a 1.4 point at you right now. And yeah, you know, I stopped it down a bit more just to be sure. And that's yeah. locked right on your retina right. the whole time while you're talking. But still, uh, if you got to have it in focus, if you're getting paid to get in focus, if it's going to be a big deal and you can't reshoot that. Yeah, I know. No, I, how I many times that happened like when you, you think you got it? You didn't blow it up on the screen and you put it on a computer and it's like, Oh my God! Are you kidding me right now? Frustrating. Are you so kidding frustrating. me? Any camera that isn't going to just grab focus and lock onto somebody's eyeball and hang onto it while they're doing somersaults, yeah, isn't going to sell. No, that's where we're not at anymore. Right now. I think we're in that. I think we're in that that uh, era now where you know you got to look back when these news these old newspaper guys were using those uh, graflex garflex cameras where they had to use the 4 by 5 sheet film when you look at the viewfinder it's upside down and backwards because there's no there's no mirrors to mm. correct it right but think about back in the day when the newspaper guys they they have a they have a pouch with these uh, film holders and you put it in you got to pull the dark slide out you take the picture put the dark slide in Pull the film holder out, flip it, put it back in, pull the dark side out, take another shot, put the dark side <laughs> in, take that out, put it in your bag as exposed, add a new one. I mean, you know, now that then we go to 35 millimeter, you know, and now you get 24, 36 exposures, you know, you're still under the you're still under the gun. To, you know, if you're on a, you know, at an assignment where you're where you're flying through film, you know, I don't even know how these sports guys did it. These these uh you know, uh, Sports Illustrated photographers, football guys, when you get that that guy leaping over a, a mound of players and it's super tack sharp, but it was with film and, and manual focus. How did they do it? You know, and now now we're in the realm of these, these the, the younger generation that have no idea what it's like to manually focus a camera or manually or, you know, adjust the, the, the apertures and the shutter speeds to get it right. It, I don't know. They're missing out. They're, they're missing out on, their, on what it was really like. They're missing out on quite a bit, I think. I still shoot 35 millimeter once in a while. I've got a Nikon FG and uh, an F4. And a box of some pretty respectable 35 millimeter. I got the Velvia and some of yeah, the other yeah. sexy 35 millimeters. Yeah, right? I got really into that again in 2016. I hadn't shot film in a long time. So I got really into that in 2016, and it ended up saving my ass. I was outside, uh, 7.30 a.m., I was hired to do a groundbreaking out in Glenville. So I've got uh, two senators and all these uh, big-ticket uh, donors all lined up with their hard hats and their shovels. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Freezing cold winter. Everybody's waiting to get the shot. The news is there. They're getting their shot. They got the video cameras. We're all competing. It's my turn to get the shot. Autofocus won't work. <laughs> nice. Oh, that was on the uh, Nikon D850 with the 204070 2.8G, which at the time was the go-to if you're a Nikon shooter. That's what you would use. Yeah. And uh, the autofocus just wouldn't work. 
and <clears throat> I got my flash, uh, but I had been shooting manuals so much. All I did was I stopped down a bit and I already had my maximum ISO with the flash set to 2000. So I knew it wasn't going to go crazy. Yeah. I flipped it auto ISO and I just did a manual burst and I had a good enough flash on there that it gave me the whole burst. And uh, just gently did my manual focus back and forth. So I did about 20 shots all in a row, and I was able to composite it together. So I had 15 people with all the eyes open. That shot went out in the press release two hours later. Yeah. Uh, so if I didn't have that muscle memory, that might have gotten me in trouble. Well, that the uh, that being a professional is when your stuff is royally screwing up, you got to look cool and calm and collected on the outside, <laughs> but your inside, you're bouncing off walls trying yeah. to figure out what in the hell is going on. So many times that's that's happened to me. I mean, there was a time that we were rushing at a wedding. I was, I was, things were running really behind. We were only at the bride's house, and uh, I was shooting Hasselblads at the time. And, uh, you know, we're running, it's extremely late. <clears throat> so... I thought to myself, well, you know, we're going to be rushing when we get to the church. So I'm going to switch film now. So I'm all set to go because I had finished the roll at the house, right? So I opened up the back to switch the, to switch the film, and I didn't have any film in the camera. So I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me right now? So what I had to do, I said, you know what? I know we're rushing. I know we're, we're falling behind, but... The light in that room looks so much nicer now. I did, I got to grab a couple more shots. Exactly. We go in, we do a couple more shots because they don't remember. Nope. They'll never remember when the film comes back that, oh, what about those shots before these? They would never remember that. So, But I freaked out. I opened up the back and I, I just totally just, I just lost this. And you got to be kidding me right now. I, I am such an idiot. But back then you could sort of get away with saying, oh, those didn't come out. Yeah, I mean, if I've had to do as that. As long too. as you got something uh, well, that they're happy with. I had to do that where I had nothing. <laughs> you know, I use a leaf shutter lens on a, on a Mamiya camera, and, you know, uh, in order to use the leaf shutter lens, <clears throat> your shutter speed on the camera had to be below a, th a 30th of a second to, to really make, to, to get the full effect from the leaf shutter. And that's for getting, you know, for shooting um, a high shutter sink using a leaf shutter. So the, the, the girl said, hey, I want to do all these pictures on my future in-law's house because the property is so beautiful. You know, we're all going to get ready there. Can you come? We're going to go there. I said, okay, that's fine. So I, I, I knew this, and I knew it was, it was going to be a bright day. So I asked my buddy, can I use your leaf shutter lens? He goes, sure. You know, so I go grab it. Never used it before. Never even messed with it, nothing. Just put it on the camera. Took all the pictures at the house go to the church, and I looked down, and the cameras, the shutter speed on the camera was on a 60th of a second. And I'm thinking, eh, I know I had it on, I know I had it on a 30th or lower, because I know it was, uh, the Mamiya cameras, the one electronic camera, the shutter was, it would stick out to the side, and if it hit your leg, it would, it would the shutter wasn't lock, mm -hmm. you know, the shutter dial. So I said, my leg probably hit it and went to 60th. So I didn't, I didn't even worry about it. Film came back, two rolls totally blank. <laughs> Specifically at the house, to get the pictures at the house. So, you know, and I had to tell her, you know, the lab messed your film up. I don't know, you know, they put it in the wrong process. It's like, uh, damn I'm not taking the blame for that. <laughs> that was, uh, what was that? That had to be 28 years ago, 29 years ago. So we're here at your studio, and you probably got about three, four, or five hundred photos all over the walls here. My favorite one's that Billy Joel shot over there. I just like the light, and happen to be a Billy Joel fan, and all that. That was a. Um, I was lucky to get that shot. Uh, you know, um, and all these pictures that were that you see and that we that we discuss are on my. Most of them are on my website. Dino Petroselli photo com, but that picture there, that was the last shoot I ever did with the Discovery Channel in two thousand six. So I'm in the back, I'm in the um, backstage before you know I'm there for the sound check and shot the sound check and I'm there you know for the interview in the back with the Discovery Channel and all that stuff. 
Um, <clears throat> and I was supposed to be on the stage, you know, hovering one of the camera guys doing the whole shoot. But the management of Billy Joel said, there's no way you're coming on the stage. There's already too many people, right? So you're going to have to be in the front. I said, oh, okay. So I go down in the front and security's there. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting with the Discovery Channel. So I'm going to go up to the, to the stage now. You know how they have the pit? You know, you can only get so far. He I've goes, been in the pit. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> I, didn't even, I couldn't even get, no, no, there was no pit. It was just the stage. So there was no, there was no security, nothing, and no photographer pit, no nothing. So it was just the stage. So the, um, so I told the uh, the security at the end of the row, you know, I had my credentials and everything. I said I got to go up there, and you know, because I'm shooting for the Discovery Channel. Because you can't go up there until the third song, and that's when we let everybody go. So they let. All the fans rush the stage after the third song, right? Wonderful. And I'm freaking because I'm, I I'm getting paid. I'm getting paid $1,200 to, to take these pictures, right? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I can't fight this. I can't. I've just got to do it, you know? So as soon as that third song came on, I, I was a madman. You know, I'm, uh, what was I, 40? I was a 45-year-old madman. Bouncing off these, you know, uh, twenty-five-year-old kids. A lot of young kids there, and I just elbowed. And I didn't. When it comes to that, I don't care. I'm gonna walk on you. I'm gonna elbow you. I'm gonna get where I need to get. And I got that shot. And the producer of the show. Well, he was a cameraman in that shot, but the, he became the producer. And I saw him at, in Vegas when they had the uh, biker build-offs out there, and we were chatting. He goes, "That picture you did with us." camera guys in there and giving that bike to Billy Joel. That is one of the best photos I've ever had taken of myself. I said, oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. So yeah, that was, that was, that was insane. Really insane. I also did a thing with uh, Junior when he, uh, he did a bike for the uh, 9-11 Memorial bike and he was doing the unveil. So <clears throat> It was, he, he hired me personally to drive down and take the pictures of him come riding up on the bike and giving it to the, you know, to the, to the memorial. And um, it's the first time, I, I don't want this job for anything, to be an AP photographer or whatever, because it was the first time that I had dealings with AP and, um, you know, Asshole photographers. I hate competing so with the press. I just said, because they're all bouncing me out of the way. Yeah. Now I'm there for a reason. I'm there for Paul Jr. He hired me personally to do this shoot. I'm not there for your paper or your magazine or whatever. I'm here for this guy. So I just, I became a bigger asshole. And I started elbowing, pushing, and shoving. I didn't care who was behind me. I didn't care who I was blocking. They're, they're pushing me like I'm like some, like a lot of them knew each other. You know, because they're in the game down there. So, you know, so I just had to, I just had to do my thing and I got some killer shots. But I got pictures that run on my slideshow of me. You could see me in the pack of all these cameras and, and uh, video guys and, uh, and uh, still photographers, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was crazy too. But I don't, I, I wouldn't want that. I, I, I'm not that, I'm not that photographer. I'm not the guy, I'm not the, uh, the press guy. I, I couldn't do it. Could not do it. Whenever I have run-ins with those folks, I always think the same thing, man. Uh, yeah. Like, you don't seem like you like your job. That's well, look the way at it the, seems look with at, those folks. I, I'm not at the paparazzis. I think they're a bunch of jackasses, and I don't care what shot you're going for. You take a shot and then leave. Exactly. Why you got to follow these these stars? That's why they, they, they have such a bad name. I mean, let them, leave them alone. Let them, you know... Uh, you know, and then, well, I'm doing it. I'm getting paid to do this. It, this isn't a job. You're, you're, you're being a jackass and you're, you know, you're really intruding on people's private lives. And I'm not into that. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. No way. That's why they keep passing more and more laws in California against those folks. Yeah. yeah. Even like when I did Billy Joel, um, I was working for the Discovery Channel. And at the end, now I'm elbow to elbow with him. I'm, I'm standing here. He's standing right next to me. 
And we have similar look. And my wife says, you, you really remind me of Billy Joel. And so I would have loved to have had a picture taken side by side with him, right? I mean, I have a wall with pictures with, with celebrities and, and I wasn't afraid to ask, but I wasn't being paid by, it wasn't a, you know, it was, there was a lot going on. A lot of people were having their pictures taken with them. So I just, I would jump in. So uh, when the interview was over and Billy Joel was going back to his dressing room, he goes, okay, are we all set here? Anybody need anything else? And I'm standing here, he's standing there. And I was like, it was right on the tip of my tongue. I, I want to, can I just get a picture taken with you? I know I, know I shouldn't do this, but I want to do it. But I just, <laughs> I, just, the professional side of me just kept it, kept it from me saying it because I, I really wanted it. But in retrospect, I should have did it because I'd have it now. And yeah, he wouldn't have minded. He would have did it, but yeah. you know. But I did. I made took that picture, and I actually made two copies of that picture and had that had one sent to him, and he kept one, and then he signed one for me. But you know, you think he would have put a really cool shot, to, you know, appreciate it, but he just signed his name. Thanks. Good thanks. Enough. That's it. Just really <laughs> tall. Ah, <laughs> so. oh, yeah, that came out beautiful. Yeah, that's a good, that's really, a, that's an awesome shot. Absolutely. So, let me look here. You want questions? I got a couple more questions. Sure, ask. We got All a right. few more minutes here. What makes a great photographer? One, one, your eye. You can't just say when you're 40 that I'm going to be a photographer because it doesn't work. You can't do that. It's something that you have to grow into. It's almost like being a baseball player. You can't just start playing baseball at, you know, 25 and think you're going to be a professional at 30. You know, it's the same thing. But the, the main thing that I tell people, you know, and, and again, it go, goes back to what your, what your uh, advice to young people, know how your camera functions work. Not, you don't need to know the internal mechanisms of what makes how the shutter opens in the digital, how you can get, you know, a thousand digital files on a tiny little card and make wall prints all day long. I don't mean that, but I mean how your shutter speed, how your f-stop and how your ISO all work together. Once you learn that, if you don't ever learn that, then you're never going to be a good photographer because you don't know what you're doing. I have people rent the studio sometimes that don't know what they're doing. They don't know the exposure triangle, but they're right. here in a professional studio. Yeah, making money, which, which kills me. <laughs> you know, I'll say, okay, so what's your shutter at? Well, what do you mean? Well, your shutter. Well, you can't be, you know, you, you, know, it, you can't be above 200th of a second on your shutter. Well, why not? I say, because it, your camera, you, you, all of a sudden you're going to see, start seeing a black line. Your shutter's opening and closing faster than the light's recording. And then I'll say, just bring your shutter down to like a 30th of a second or something. Well, then it's going to be blurry. I said, well, no, <laughs> it's not going to be blurry. In fact, I had an art director in here. I was uh -huh. shooting a car. Yep. And he goes, how come you don't use a tripod? I said, why do I need a tripod? He goes, to keep everything steady and you get sharp images. I said, I'm shooting at a... 60th of a second at F16. That's sharp as a tack. He goes, you don't get any camera motion? I said, I'm going to prove something to you right now. I said, I'm going to put my camera on that second. And I'm going to shoot that car. And then we're going to put it on a big screen. And you're going to see how sharp it is. Put the camera down to a second. Shot it. Put it on a screen. He goes, oh my God. You're not kidding. The Parts that were the, the highly reflective parts had a little bit of a mm. little camera shake. From the ambient. But because it's like I do a shot, I used to do a wedding shot, I haven't done it in a while, where I would tell the bride and groom to make a fist and show their rings. Then in the, so their rings would be focused and, and then cells, they'd be so far from the, from the lens, they'd be out of focus, which is what I wanted. So I said, you guys kiss in the background, right? And I do it to where there's lights in the background, like colored lights, stage lights or whatever. So when they're kissing, I put the camera on like a third of a second. And I say, okay, start kissing. And then I'll fire the shutter and then I'll twist the camera. 
So now what you're getting is you're getting all that background light. You put them, you put them in like a tunnel. At their sharpest attack, might be a little bit of ghosting, mm -hmm. but you get all that color around the around the side of them. You see, people ask me, "What do you do that in Photoshop?" I said, "No, that's in the camera. It's how you, it's working the camera to its fullest." I don't know how to work the camera. I don't know how to what shutter speeds and what f stops and what you know. I had somebody uh, that was working with me, and she says, I, I bought a lens so I can get the backgrounds out of focus. And your, your pictures are so unbelievably out of focus. I don't know how, how you do it. So I said, well, let me see how you're shooting. Let me, let's, so we opened them up, opened the images up in Bridge. 3200 ISO, F16 at like um, 500 of a second. Yeah. Right time of day. So I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> I say, why? Okay, your shutter and your ISO are, and everything's off. Well, what do you mean? And I had to explain to her what the shutter speed and the f stops do. Well, everything. You know, when you're at 2.8, very little's in focus in the background. When you're at f16, everything's in focus. And when you're at 3200, you have to be at F16 outside because it's so bright out and you're at such a high shot. It, it was so, then she got it and her stuff looked so much better. But, but it's like, you know, it's like, you know, I'm looking at, I tell people when you look at an image, if your eye is trying to find what it's looking at, then it's not a good shot. Your eye needs to focus on what you want it, the, the viewer to focus on. You know what I mean by that, right? You know, so if you're not utilizing your depth of field, like if I take a picture of you and everything behind you is super sharp too, my eye's going everywhere. What's, what's my center of interest? Where, where am I looking? Exactly. You know, that's why it's so nice to work those, the F-stops to get that background, that soft background where just what you want to be solid is solid. So you got this R6. You upgrade from the 5D Mark IV? Yeah. And before that, the 5D Mark III? I had the three. I had the two. Yeah. I had the, the, um, uh, they weren't, they weren't 5Ds. They were Mark, they were just Mark IIs, like a Canon Mark II. But, you know, that's when 18 megapixels, you know, you know, way back when digital first started. I mean, I was using, I was bringing uh, little Kodak cameras that did, they were like, you know, five megapixels. But you could get a four or five meg file out of it. I was use, use them for black and whites, small black and whites, and it was cool. So I was getting even them little Kodak instant digital cameras way back when. You know, then just things progressed. I mean, me, me and my buddy used to laugh. Oh my God, I came out with a 10 megapixel. They thought I got a 20 megapixel. Holy crap, you know. It just keeps going and going. How many megapixels are the R6? That's 20. 20, okay. Now, the, the 5 has a 40. Now, maybe over the summer when the wedding cash flow starts with weddings starting back up, hopefully I'm going to turn that other Mark IV into a Mark five, uh, uh, R5 and then use the R5 more specifically for commercial work. Not that the R6 can't handle it, because it can, uh, but it's nice to have that extra, you know. But when I do a wedding with that R5, uh, that R, uh, R5, I'm only going to shoot half raw, because I don't even even with this, I'd probably go a little less. But I'm not gonna because it's 20 megapixel. The Mark IV was 30. The 30, I would I would shoot at half resolution size, because I don't need when you do a wedding and you're shooting 2,000 images, you don't need all that. You don't need that much. You only need a little, a little bit. So why waste all that space? Yeah, tw twenty is more than enough for most. for a wedding. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you're not going over sixteen by twenty normally. Yeah. And even then, that's fine. So, what do you think about people saying you ought to double or even triple the reciprocal rule since these cameras are so sharp now? Used to be like that. I remember being told, uh, let's say you're using a hundred millimeter lens. Uh, your focal length uh, should uh, be your minimum shutter speed. So if I have oh. 100 millimeter, uh, I should never go below one one hundredth of a second 
or else I'll have motion blur from my lens. Yeah. Open. Ask me how often I go by that rule. I break it successfully all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what you got to do is you got to be mm -hmm. careful. Well, the, the Joe McNally technique, using your elbow and the exactly. three points, uh, works really well. This is really the well. argument I have with people yeah. when they say, well, I just use a live shutter. Oh, so you're shooting out here. And that's exactly what I say, what you just said. You're shooting out here using that screen. I can't do that for two reasons. When I'm shooting and my eyes in the viewfinder, I feel like I'm in the camera. Exactly. I'm inside it. There's nobody around me. I could be standing in front of the parents of the bride watching them cut the cake, and I don't even know they're there because I'm, I'm in the moment. I'm in the camera. All that matters is what I'm looking at, right? If I'm out here, now I see everybody around me. I feel people looking at me. I can see all that, right? You know, the only time I use live view at events is if it's a weird angle and I can't use the... Yeah, or like low, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the other point, what you just said, how do you, how do you stabilize the camera out here? How can you possibly, with a, with a lens on there, stabilize the camera when it's out here? This is where, this is your, tri your body is your tripod, you know? Exactly. Yeah, and they're getting better and better and sharper and sharper. And yeah, some folks are saying if you got a hundred millimeter, you should, your minimum shutter speed should be one three hundredth. Yeah, something like that. If okay. they want to be up that high, that's. I shoot. You know, again, I, I I push the limits a lot. I lose a lot of shots because I push the limits. But when when it's working and it's on, there's. There's nothing like it. I mean, you know, you, 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 my thing is if you're going slower shutter speed, like I'll tell people at a re reception, you know, my average shutter speed at a reception is a 15th of a second. 15th of a second. Everything's going to be blurry. It says, no, it's not blurry because your flash is freezing the subject and everything else around it is dark. If, it's, if you got video lights or it's bright in there, then, yeah, and I've ruined some shots, but I've gotten some. You know what it's like when you see a couple dancing? I mean, fast dancing, and the coolest shot in the world is when they're frozen, and then your background is all, like, blurred. I like it shows, those. It shows action. It shows, like, in the moment, motion. Yeah, using the strobe to stop the action. Yeah, and, exactly. And that's, you know, up until maybe a few years ago, that was really necessary to avoid having really grainy low light shots yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, now it's a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, like you know, with that beautiful seventy to two hundred, maybe you'll switch on the IS or the image stabilization, the vibration reduction, as yeah. Nikon calls it. And you know, I got one of the newer lenses, uh, the the newest twenty four to seventy, two point eight VR two. Oh, it's yeah. the E-Series for Nikon, and that one's way better. So I can switch the uh, image stabilization on on that, and it doesn't soften it nearly as much. Yeah. So I'll hit that switch, you know, rather than push my sensor gain a little too much. Yeah. You know, if I don't have strobes, you know, if I just, I'm forced to just shoot ambient light. Yeah, sometimes I'll tell you, you know, when they're doing like a first dance or something, I'll, I'll turn all the strobes off. Because sometimes the uh, uh, the video light, if there's a video, it'll light them up good. But a lot of these places, a lot of these DJs bring that up lighting now. And to get, you don't get that background light when you're using flash, when you're using strobes. I mean, you can get it a little bit, but when you turn all the strobes off and you just use the natural light and it's sharp, what a, it looks so awesome. Yeah. But, so that's something yeah. to really look forward to as, the, as these sensors get better and yeah. better and better. I've got a shot that I did a 20 by 30 print at ISO 102,400. <laughs> How'd yeah. that come out? It's awesome. Yeah. There's a shot of the spinning. Uh, you missed it. Don't worry about it. There it is. Which it, <laughs> not that <time. laughs> <laughs> um, But... Uh, if you have the right contrast and you know the 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 right the right look, that you can go as high as you want with them ISOs and have a great looking shot. Yep. You know. So you know it'd be fun to do one day. Get a bunch of different cameras, like a succession of cameras, and shoot basically the same thing. You know, just have like a model or something, 
and do exactly the same shot with a whole bunch of different cameras. Film all the way up to the newest, most yeah, expensive digital. Yeah, that would be digital. cool, right? Yeah. That would be uh, cool. And process it as closely as possible yeah. and then compare them all. Right. You know, because yeah. even the 5D Mark II to the Mark IV was such a drastic oh, yeah. improvement. Yeah. The last Canon camera I owned was the 5D Mark II. Yeah. Uh, respectable camera, you know, good enough for the White House photographer at the time and also yeah, other right. people. Got some beautiful shots with it. Yeah. But it had major limitations. It does. Especially I mean, it's not that it, it really isn't, you know, I mean, a lot of people think it's the camera. You can give me a Rebel. I'm going to take awesome mm -hmm. pictures with the Rebel. I mean, it may not be, you know. Not uh, with the kit lens, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even the kit lens, they've been forced to make them better. Yeah. Yeah. Canon and Nikon kit yeah. lenses have gotten a lot better. Those USM motors they're using in yeah. there. And yeah, much better. But uh, I really appreciate you taking the time for all this today. No, I'm glad you came by. This is awesome. I hope people, you know, I mean, again, my door is always open. I rent this place out. If you want to come by and check things out, by all means. You know, it'd be nice to have like a, like a, maybe we could plan that over the winter, you know, if COVID gets a little bit better, uh, having a little photo, just get together, just get all the people that we know that we, that shoot to come in and hang out and get new people to come in. It'd be fun to kind of do that, but. I never get tired of doing those. I do a lot of group shoots. You know, I go to almost every group shoot I'm invited to. So I always learn something. I always have a good time and I always walk away with shots I'm happy with. Yeah. And do some workshops. There's a lot of folks that want to learn how to do headshots and other stuff like that. Right. You know, I was thinking it might be fun to do some workshops where there are some live students, but it's mainly designed for online content for people to go online and watch yeah. on YouTube. But uh, what social media websites you got? Well, there? my website is actually dinopetrocellifoto.com because uh, <clears throat> I switched over website uh, hosts or people doing my website and nobody transferred the information and somebody pirated my name, wanted to sell me my name, dinopetrocelli.com back for 50 grand. 50. 50. Yeah. Am I worth that much? <laughs> I said, throw the name out. I don't care. Let somebody else buy it. So I added photo to the, to the end of that, but that was a pain in the ass. Cause then I had to get all the social media, you know, all the Google and stuff to recognize that. So it took like a good year to, to get back up in the, in the standings. And then, uh, you know, Facebook is just my name on Facebook and I've got my personal page. I got my, you know, business page. Yeah. You know, I got a YouTube page. Just, Go on YouTube, type in Dino Petroselli and, you know, subscribe and follow me on YouTube. I put stupid stuff up there, too. Just fun, you know, doing donuts in the snow with my windows open. That kind <laughs> of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the next step. That's what I'm going to be getting into, uh, doing some of these, putting up uh, YouTube. Yeah. Uh, as well as all the RSS feeds, yeah. you know, for the standard podcast. Right. I'm, I'm actually going through a lot of old video footage. I had a camera crew following me around for like two years on a whole bunch of different shoots. And I'm picking little pieces. Uh, the way it was done, I can't do it in Premiere. I can't do it in iMovie because it's it's jittery and jumpy. But the way it was the way it was downloaded, I, I don't get it. But I can do it in um, QuickTime. But I can't edit it. It's, you can't. You don't have the editing power in QuickTime. But I can at least do. I can at least get what I want. And I want to put music on it, but I can't control the sound of the music for the background. So I'm trying to find. Because music always makes a makes a, a video or a whatever, you know. I just I just like it, but uh, yeah. So I mean, the Instagram. I mean, it's my name on Instagram too. But I'm just not a, you know, I'm not up on Instagram. I'm trying to do more, but it's so hard. Social media is a whole job in itself. I don't spend hardly any time with any of that. Yeah, uh, I like I like getting out there and creating content. How I choose to share that, that's you exactly. know, a work in progress. You know, it would have been nice to have, uh, you know, pictures going around the back, but you can see the wall back here is loaded with pictures. And, you know, but you see a lot of the pictures that, you know, that we were talking about on my website. And, you know, maybe when this goes up, we'll throw some stills up with it would also. But no, I appreciate you, you coming by and, you know, hanging out. For sure. I hope to do it again soon. Hi, buddy. Thank you.